What is bureaucracy for? Dear Lily, as soon as societies developed complex organizations, the state, churches, cities, they needed organizers and managers. Almost all activities, in fact, need some rules and administration. No game could be played, no arts performed, no knowledge transmitted, no products made, if there were not rules and umpires, referees and teachers to administer them. Schools, hospitals, courts of law, libraries, universities, industrial firms, parliaments, all need rules and all need bureaucracy. Unadulterated, unadulterated foodstuffs, uniform measures and standards, agreed rules about behavior, all need supervision. So bureaucracy is one of the great tools of civilization. Nowadays, most organizations need an accountant, a lawyer, a secretary, and an administrator. Our lives would collapse into disorder without bureaucracy. As a form of government, it has many things to commend it, especially when compared with its competitors. The aim of the bureaucrat is to apply uniform rules to uniform cases, to work by a recognized code. Favoritism, corruption, the emotional tugs of power, patronage, family ties, should be rejected. Impersonal rules should be imposed. All of this is very commendable. In this letter, however, I shall concentrate on the negative side of bureaucracy, for this is less often noticed. How do people keep order? Under traditional authority, society is held together by rulers whom we obey because they represent the past, the ancestral and customary wisdom. Obedience is unquestioning, passed on from generation to generation by succession to offices of power vested with authority. A king, a chief, a priest, all have this type of authority. From time to time, such traditional authority is challenged and sometimes overthrown in a moment of creative chaos by the personal insights and dynamism of a single individual. Why such moments of charismatic, literally meaning a laying on of hands, authority occur? whether through the life of the Buddha, Jesus Christ, Genghis Khan, Oliver Cromwell, Napoleon, or Chairman Mao, is a large question. What is certain is that the periods inaugurated by a charismatic leader tend to last only a short time. Soon the founder dies. Yet he or his followers may set up institutions which live by the rules of pres or precedents that he outlined, whether he was St. Benedict or Karl Marx. This leads to the third type of authority, the setting of impartial rules and standards operated by trained officials in a bureaucracy, literally 
power in a place where paper is stored. All of history can be read as a tension between these types of authority. In fact, they usually coexist rather than replacing each other. The prophet relies on bureaucratic structures. The civil service relies on the charisma of politicians. Why do organizations grow? The benefits of bureaucracy make it attractive to many. Increased efficiency can lead to better medical care, better traffic control, a better economy, and all sorts of benefits that make life run smoothly. Bureaucrats can stand out against the partisan influence of, or of connections and kinship and the corruptions of threat and bribery. Bureaucracy is a powerful bulwark against revolution, subversion and over-enthusiasm. It can protect scarce resources, allocate wealth more fairly and protect the weak from the strong. As the poet Alexander Pope put it, for forms of government let fools contest whatever is best administered is best. So there is very often a growing desire to control through administrative action, to use bureaucracies as an arm of government. The state holds the people together primarily through administrative centralization. As it seeks to extend its power, so it increases its chief tool of power, bureaucracy. There is a powerful pressure towards multiplying the number and control of bureaucrats. A second, much more recent trend in modern states is the desire to encourage equality of access and execution of rules. This usually opens with a campaign against inequality, privilege and special favours with a desire to level and redistribute what there is. In order for this to happen, everything must be flattened, be put on the same level. Communist societies try to abolish classes and the state ends up with all-powerful administrative classes and the nightmare of incompatible rules which few believe in. It is no accident that the Soviet Union was ruled by something called the Polit Politburo, the political bureau. For much of the past, bureaucracies were used to maintain inequality to extract wealth from the mass of the population and distribute it to the privileged. Since the American and French revolutions of the late 18th century, the desire to enforce equality through bureaucratic pressures has been related to the desire to enforce equality and individualism. It is proclaimed that individuals have inherent rights and if these are infringed then there must be action to protect them. That is fine up to a point. The problem is that it is much easier to define and protect individual rights than to define and defend the wider community or social rights much easier and more profitable 
for a bureaucrat or lawyer to deal with single individuals than with communities. Are organizations a disease? One reason bureaucracies grow is the desire to increase power and pay. As each procedure in an organization is made into a job, it creates ecological niches or nesting places, as it were, for officials who live off the institution. Since there is little power, pay or prestige if one has few or no subordinates, to increase their power and importance, each bureaucrat tries to increase the number of their assistants. The number of officials very quickly expands to consume the resources available. As soon as a germ, using a metaphor for an administrator, moves into a new body, a hospital, a school, a university, a law court, it breeds, dividing and subdividing tasks creating needs that only new administrators can fulfill. It develops or applies a special status enhancing language, goals, benchmarks, mission statements. This compensates for the fact that it is in the nature of such professional administrators that they have no particular skill or knowledge of the area in which they are working. They are not trained to give lectures, to perform surgical operations, or to teach children. They probably know little of the content. Yet they do know how to work in local politics, how to deal with outside bureaucratic agencies. They are trained to help to bring in money, to minimize risk, to mod to homogenize and generalize rules and to avoid some of the corruption of individual action and subjective judgments. Examples of bureaucratic systems becoming ever larger and more powerful are widespread. For example, a constant flow of requests for information or the bringing in of new rules has quite overwhelmed the central administration in many universities, hospitals and police forces in Britain. So the administrators try to handle this by creating new posts and also passing on parts of the load down the system. Lower down, the burden rises and new administrative posts are set up, then soon overwhelmed which again passes further work on down. The great analyst of, bureaucrat of bureaucracies, C. Northcote Parkinson, gives a good example of what happened. In 1914, the British Navy had 62 capital ships in commission, run by 2,000 Admiralty officials. By 1928 there were 20 capital ships, one third, run by three and a half thousand Admiralty officials, moving towards twice the number. There was, as was noted, a magnificent navy on land since the number of ships had decreased by 67%, while that of the bureaucrats had increased by 78%. To believe that the spread of more administrators will either diminish workloads or even lead to more efficient administration, measured by input, output of time and energy, 
is as naive as to assume that computers will one day bring less work for humans or create the paperless office. So what is bureaucracy? Bureaucracy is an extremely efficient and effective system because it rests on a rational ordering of time and space. It's based on the idea of a bureau or writing desk with drawers in it. Everything must fit in somewhere. The fact that many things are untidy or fit between categories cannot be allowed for. Ideally, everything should be placed on an equal level on the desk. Like cases, like solutions, a level playing field, universal tariffs. Do not allow discretion or personal circumstances to cloud judgment. Everything should be comparable. Since qualities cannot be compared as in apples and oranges, they must be reduced to something similar, for example, weight or volume. It is also necessary to generate some principle of filing the information that is collected so that it can be reused. Usually a hierarchical storage system is created based on stating very general principles and then working to split these layer after layer until every conceivable type of case has its own pigeonhole. The bureaucracy disapproves of all rule breaking which it tends to label corruption. It thrives on the multiplication of rules attempting to make provision for every kind of situation and trying to prevent individuals in the group from exercising too much personal discretion. Another tendency is towards centralization of power. If possible, decisions are moved upwards in the system. Too much delegated power is to be avoided as it might lead to a lack of uniformity, unprincipled exceptionalism. If it can be shown that different parts of the same institution act differently, this is equivalent to corruption. Usually in a bureaucracy, not only is there a hierarchical arrangement of the drawers, so that rules are of a rigid kind, but the organization of roles is hierarchical. This means that every decision of any importance has to be ratified by someone higher up the chain. Why measure everything? It has often been noted that assessing is a very strong feature of bureaucracies. They always wish to place things on lists in their attempt to turn uniquely varied qualities into measurable quantities. This is very obvious in all work walks of life. In schools there are increasing numbers of tests which are marketed as good for the child, parent and school. Assessments are made available in order to mark progress towards targets and to make some kind of comparison between the intrinsically incomparable. In hospitals, universities and elsewhere it is the same. One particularly intriguing and rapid growth in one branch of this desire to assess is the wish to try to protect against the future. There is now a huge business of risk assessment. There are many organizations and individuals who spend their lives trying to quantify and specify and hence in theory diminish risks. Since life is full of risk 
When consulted, they usually suggest extreme caution. Another technique of modern bureaucracies uses the metaphor of the path or track, namely the audit trail. The old saying that justice must not only be done, but be seen to be done, now applies to all administration. It's not enough to teach or examine well, but every stage must be put on paper so that if there is an inquiry or audit, the paper trail is clear, unambiguous and correct. The principle of finance, that everything must be accounted for, that life is to be reduced to a double entry page, that there must be written receipts for everything, is now applied more generally. There are now teaching audits, research audits, hospital, legal and many other kinds of audit. If it moves, salute it. If it doesn't move, whitewash it, used to be an army saying. The equivalent now is, if it is unpredictable at all, risk assess it. If it leads to an outcome, make an audit trail. Is bureaucracy a danger? A certain amount of bureaucracy, accountability and organisation is vital for the world we live in. The benefits of bureaucracy do not need to be promoted. Yet the hidden costs of overdoing the regulation are very considerable. As the rules multiply, it becomes so difficult to do anything that one has to cheat or break the rules in order to survive. Indeed. Since the rules often conflict with each other, and whatever one does breaks some rule, it becomes a question of choosing between illegalities. I still remember how surprised I was when a building regulations inspector came to check the house we live in. We'd put in a new staircase without a handrail. He said it was unsafe and must have a handrail. When we put it in, he said that it was now too narrow for safety. Short of pulling down much of a 17th century structure, we were bound to break the rule one way or the other. The system becomes ever more complicated with more and more rules. Rather than leading to openness and transparency, which was the original intention, this leads to a situation where only a highly trained specialist, professional bureaucrat of course, knows how it works. There is, as a result, more space for hidden corruption. There is also a loss of personal incentives. Humans like freedom and responsibility in their lives. They like to be given basic guidance and then encouraged to get on with things to be ingenious and creative in their solutions. As bureaucracy increases, people are ever more rule-bound, forced to work by the book. This means that jobs become dead. Creative and ingenious solutions are often frowned upon. The hierarchical nature of bureaucracy leads to duplication, the erosion of trust and individual creativity, and the emergence of a surveillance society. It ends up in the typical Japanese office with its endless stamps and fear of being the nail that sticks up, which will quickly be hammered down. One unexpected effect of over-bureaucratization is the spread of cynicism. For much of English history, rules were few but were observed and respected. 
The proliferation of rules, as in the Soviet Union, means that they are seen as obstacles, nuisances, pressures which work against the individual, barriers to get round and break, if possible. Cunning, cheating, deviance, and learning the real rules behind the rules, and what it, it is all about, a phenomenon found in all over-centralized bureaucracies. This breeds cynicism, since the less successful, the small rule breakers, assume that the successful have got to where they are by cheating, bribery, corruption, and breaking rules. Another harmful effect of overactive bureaucracies is that they divert talent. In almost all organizations, the higher someone's pay and the higher their status, the less practical work and the more administration they do. A head teacher who was perhaps an excellent communicator does not teach anymore. An excellent surgeon ends up doing paperwork as head of a hospital. A brilliant academic is finally the administrative head of a university. None of them any longer does the thing he or she most enjoyed or is good at. They spend their time as fundraisers, personnel officers, chairs of committees. It's a widespread tendency. If you can do anything well, stop doing it and become an administrator. The aim of the bureaucrat is to prevent corruption, which is to def defined as the use of human contacts, networks, allowing in warmth, affection and emotion. Ironically, the proliferation of rules often means that the only way to cut through them is precisely through a form of networking, or as is known in Nepal as Afno Manche, literally my own people, knowing someone and using ties of patronage. A further effect is waste of time and effort, much of it never accounted for, despite the fact that bureaucracy is supposed to be accountable. In case an institution might need to justify an action, huge amounts of time are spent on concocting audit trails, lengthy agendas, minutes, papers to cover every aspect of everything. The time and energy spent doing all this, when set against the cost of any likely harmful outcome, is probably out of all proportion. Yet it is held to be irresponsible not to do it. If there is trouble, the lawyers will go for the weakest point. So the bureaucracies have to lumber themselves with huge protective defenses over the whole body. Can we avoid being drowned in paper? When people looked at bureaucracy over Europe during the period 1200 to 1800, they pointed to one path that had avoided this almost universal tendency. This was to be found in England Linked to the growth of powerful middling groups, the absence of the threat of war, the nature of the common law, the proliferation of wealth and the growth of a powerful set of intermediary groupings. The state of bureaucracy in England from the 12th to the 19th centuries represented a strange paradox. England maintained a curious tension between the most centralized feudal landholding and judicial system in history, with all land ultimately held by and all justice flowing from the crown, and the most decentralized administrative system, where the legislature and executive were practically separate. Local government was extremely strong and independent down through the county 
the parish level, the size of the central bureaucracy in the capital, as well as that of the standing army and the police, was small when compared with almost every other middling-sized country in Europe. The unusual tradition, which many observers thought was one of Britain's greatest strengths, has almost vanished. Since the 1980s, bureaucracy has spread with the so-called management revolution. Every attempt to get rid of the tentacles seems only to increase the problem. So what can be done? The main thing is to be aware of the reasons for the spread of this replicating growth. The second is to be aware of its effects. The third is, if it cannot be altered, to learn how to survive within the increasingly bureaucratic system. These are arts that those living in Eastern Europe or in Italy have perfected. One obvious way to survive bureaucracy is to join it. This will be a real temptation for you when you are looking for a job, Lily. Many people have joined professions and have, by their very success, been promoted into management positions, or they have been forced to seek promotion to an administrative post to pay for the mortgage, health insurance, pensions or children's education. If you are faced with intrusive bureaucracy, you will be forced to learn various ways to outwit the system and to get round some of the more accept unacceptable tests and indices. While these techniques are important, the most important thing is to keep cheerful and positive. The most insidious feature of bureaucracy is that, like all power, it tends to affect even those who are start off as sceptical. People come to believe in the assessments, audits and mechanisms. They tend to take them very seriously and try to fit themselves into the evolving system. Once this concession has been made, there is little chance of escape. Keeping a sense of humour that mocks some of the more extreme forms of bureaucratic behaviour helps. We need to remember the jokes. Most bureaucracies have an element of the criticism made of the British civil service which provides a difficulty for every solution. A committee can often be a group that takes minutes and wastes hours. Yet being forced into such joking and the feeling of wasted talent and time are a considerable price to pay for supposed gains in efficiency. As in many of the great bureaucracies, such as classical Iran or imperial China, cynicism is corrosive of integrity, personal and civic, and of a morale, personal and public. This is the dilemma. We need an uncorrupted civil service and bureaucracy to make life in modern complex societies tolerable. A good bureaucracy can provide a strong counterforce to the power-seeking of politicians. It can run a great university, hospital, business organisation or television company with fa fairness and efficiency. For many centuries, Britain had an unusually small yet efficient bureaucratic system. Many commented on the contrast between the centralised and over-bureaucratic situation on the continent and the relatively tiny and uncorrupt system on this island in the United States. All this is under threat, but the older traditions are worth fighting for. Bureaucracies have a tendency to expand and become over-intrusive. When they combine with the worst aspect of management culture, they can become an overwhelmingly complex, time-wasting machine. They limit the freedom and creativity of individuals. Getting the balance right is very difficult indeed.